Hello, my name is Julia Minorchio. It's Wednesday, March 11th, and welcome to Citizens Forum. Today, my guests are Kim Davidson, CEO and Executive Director of BC Epilepsy Society, and Amanda Ricks. Hello, and welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thanks for being on the show. I'd just like to um, point out first um, that, Kim, you have uh, started filming a documentary series about um, epilepsy to raise awareness. And um, the first screening is going to be on the 26th of March here yes. in Victoria, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. And it's at Cinecenta? It is at Cinecenta, and it is actually on International Purple Day, which okay. is a recognized Epilepsy Awareness Day. And, and so we're going to um, attend that here in Victoria. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And if people want to buy tickets, they can buy them at uh, bcepilepsy.com. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So what's your strategy behind um, starting this documentary series? Well, the start of the documentary series really came out of, an, out of necessity. What was happening in this province and the mortality rates related to epilepsy were, were quite a, uh, astonishing. And when I was hired as the CEO Executive Director, I did an environmental scan to see what was happening with epilepsy, how many people were impacted by it. And when, what I learned was we do not have any infrastructure in this province to address the needs mm. for people living with epilepsy. And then that was also coupled by the fact that the Premier, um, Horgan, and the Minister of Health, Adrian Dix, were not responding to my requests for meetings. I had sent out nine requests and over 18 months mm. and not a single response. Mm. So the issues are really, if I can, is it okay if I just go into yeah, detail please, about what they are? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have four beds, um, seizure investigation unit beds in the province for 50,000 people. Um, other provinces with similar, similar populations have eight plus more um, beds. Actually, they have less than what we do um, in terms of population. There's a, a pharmaceutical that is available for, it's an anti-seizure epileptic medicine that's available for um, all other Canadians and covered except for in BC. Hmm. So what this means is that people who have drug resistant um, epilepsy, and there's about 14,000 in the province that do, they don't have this medication. Sure. They're paying out of pocket. They're choosing between groceries and getting their prescription every month, and it's simply not fair. The other thing that is an issue for us is, although we have the limitations for the beds and for getting assessment, we also, on the other side of that, do not have therapies available. So the therapies are, is, is, um, is a, um, the sorry. keto diet. So yeah, that, sorry, I'll start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the therapies are um, neuromodulation. Uh, for the brain, right? So then there's a BNS um, uh, device that is inserted in the chest and it attaches to the vagus nerve and that helps reduce seizures for a lot of people. Mm. In BC, our government has limited the number of those devices being used to 16. Other provinces, mm. three, four, five hundred. They would never limit the number of devices used as pacemakers for a heart, but they're limiting them for, for brains. Mm. It's absolutely insane. So that's a call to action. And this is why the provincial government wasn't meeting with me, because if they know better, they have to do better. And we can hold their feet to the fire. And what has happened in the last 18 months, of course, now that we're more aware, the number of deaths. And so that's what promoted, that's what was, I, I prov provoked me to take a look at how can we be innovative in a way to raise awareness and hold the government accountable and, and also allow families and people living with epilepsy in the province to have a voice, a meaningful voice at the table around funding decisions. And so that's how we met. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Seems quite apropos. Mm -hmm. um, so, what, so there are big gaps in the healthcare system and 40,000 people in BC with epilepsy of which 14,000 have a form of epilepsy that doesn't respond to medications. That's right. Um, do you know anything specific to the situation on the island? I, I don't have, so if you mm -hmm. take a look at the numbers, the numbers are 1% of the population, okay. right? So we just came, we're just up over now um, 5 million in BC. So the right. number's closer to 50,000 people living with okay. epilepsy. So take a look at, the, uh, at what that population is on the island. 
And in terms of the island population, you really should have a seizure investigation unit in the epilepsy program here on the mm. island. We should have one in, in the interior. We should have at least three in this province. We have the one at VGH with four beds without a ketogenic diet uh, program, mm. right? So that's the, another therapy that works well for epilepsy. It's actually an epilepsy um, medically supervised diet. That's what ketogenic mm. is. That is what the diet is. You measure, mm. um, you're measuring fats to the tenth of a gram. You're measuring um, the, you know, even toothpaste. It's very, very specific. Yeah, that would be a hard diet to follow without having proper supervision, I imagine, like a right. proper dietitian and not something you just go on the internet and figure out how no. to do on your own. No, because it's medically, it's medically supervised. Any other provinces covered in this country, mm. and BC doesn't. And, and why is that? Why is it safer for somebody to live with epilepsy in another province? And so one of the documentaries that we're doing is actually around three families that have moved to Alberta to stay alive, to get the services, to get the prescriptions, to get all of the benefits that that health, that, 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 that healthcare society provides. Yeah. And Amanda, um, I think I omitted mentioning it at the outset, but your son unfortunately very recently passed away waiting for life-saving surgery right correct um so i imagine you can speak to what day-to-day -day life for a person with epilepsy is like as well as um you know the challenges faced by their loved ones in helping them cope with the situation. Can can you give me some details about that and maybe spe it's a big some question. specific to the island? Um, yeah, Jared, Jared was diagnosed when he was eight years old um, and basically the reason that he finally did get diagnosed, he went from a little boy who loved school to a little boy who was in trouble all the time and didn't want to go to school. Mm. So that's what sparked our attention to that. Mm. Um, and we took him to the doctor and we saw seizures. I work in mental health. I, I know what a seizure looks like. Um, uh, and what I discovered was, you know, he was indeed having seizures and they were getting more frequent. Um, we were on wait lists at that point uh, for a year, uh, still waiting. When my son fell off uh, my parents' boat and almost drowned and having a seizure. So we went to emergency and we camped out and said we are not leaving until he has a seizure because the doctors would not pay attention to us. Like they wouldn't even they diagnose They said, you him. don't know what you're talking about. Oh. That, you know, we'll, we'll tell you if it's a seizure. Mm. So my son finally performs after five hours of playing cards and he has a seizure and the doctor turns to me and says, that was a seizure. And I said, I know, that's why we're here. So that began our journey of being hospitalized and him getting tested and him on medication. We did do a similar keto kind of diet. I had him seizure free by the time he was 12, mm. at which point he then had a growth spurt of a foot and a half. Mm. So back wow. came the seizures and he would try to hide them from me because he didn't want to have seizures. Um, he was um, through his adolescence always trying. Um, he was a brilliant musician. No instrument was safe. He was in a ton of bands, um, very well loved by all of his friends. Um, and sorry, um, whenever I hear the facts, it's hard for me to reel back and get grounded again um, because um, at the end, we were going to Vancouver. We went to Vancouver in 2018 at least nine times because he was getting ready for the seizure that we had, or so the surgery that we had been waiting for for three years. So he was on a wait list here for three years. We then got him on other wait lists in Montreal, Edmonton, and Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I mean, it was, just, uh, it was just disappointment after disappointment. He couldn't get his license. He couldn't pursue his career as mm -hmm. an electrician because it was too exhausting. He could barely work. I was financially supporting him. I was paying for his medications. I had arranged uh, and advocated for him to get PWD, to get the disability tax credit, to get things because he was so worried. Hmm. Excuse me. Take your time. He was such a good boy. <laughs> he was so worried about being able to support himself. And he couldn't. He was about to record his second album in January of 2019, but he passed away before he could get there. Yeah. He's three years on wait lists in four provinces. 
That's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem, and that's a problem when you have a minister of health and a premier that doesn't take the time to do a meeting with us 18 months. He was still alive yeah. when I was asking for those meetings. And he had his surgery scheduled. Yes. He finally did. Yeah. Um, but at that point, like the thing about seizures is seizures beget more seizures. Right. So he started with a focal point and what was happening was his brain was starting to train the other side of his brain to do seizures. So oh. we were losing, we were starting to get into so there's a the window. world. Well, it's seizures beget more seizures. Okay. So if, you, if your brain is left to go unchecked um, and not controlled on medication anymore, I mean, these were life-saving treatments that could have had a tremendous impact in my son's life. He couldn't get that medication that every, was available everywhere else mm. in Canada. He couldn't get the pacemaker. They, they couldn't even talk to us about that at that time. No. He, no. you know, I mean. Just they, because of that cap, you mentioned there's the only cap. 16 a year yeah. or something yeah. like should that? It should have been offered to about 5,000 people. That seems yeah. completely outrageous. Yeah. I mean, I he was a young, beautiful young man who was articulate and smart and you know the do like none of us ever thought hmm. that this would be the result you know just imagine the burden right we have the burden of the doctors too that are stuck because they only have 16 so they can't even offer it right and which 16 do you choose out of 5,000 and imagine that burden that you have to carry and then they come out the other side from the testing and then you're gonna go okay so here are the therapies available but sorry in BC we don't have them and, and sorry, we don't have a health, a health minister that is going to step forward and, and address these issues. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. There is no help on the way. And that is, and, and here we have a tragic situation. We have 40 people dying in this province every year from epilepsy, mm -hmm. potentially more, because the way we're tracking those deaths is not accurate. We are having uh, epilepsy related deaths and suicides, young people who are being uh, diagnosed and then dying by suicide under the age of 23. We have those that are dying from sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which is the medical condition that, that, that that's what happened with Jared. Mm -hmm. We have those that are dying from falls, drownings, car accidents. Mm -hmm. None of that is being tracked. In the U.S., 40,000 people will die from breast cancer, and in the U.S., 50,000 will die from epilepsy. That's how prevalent it is. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So the rage and the frustration that <laughs> you must yeah. be it's feeling yeah. is palpable. It like, is. It's hard. It's, um, and his friends. His, yeah. his friends sure. who loved him, his metal family, <laughs> um, sorry, um, who just so deeply loved him and who miss him. Yeah. Yeah, what a tragedy. Yeah. Well, it's, so yeah. They, were, they were actually saying last night they wanted to make t-shirts because one of the most startling statistics that has stuck out for us is that there is a dollar seventy nine per year in programming available per for person. adults per person. Per so person with epilepsy? Yeah. Yes. That's so it? That's it. One dollar seventy nine per person per year. Per year. In this province. For programming. So the kids were talking, they wanted to make a t shirt that says, you know, the gov the BC government says my friend Jared Ricks's life is worth a buck seventy nine a year. But to us he was priceless and they want those for this we're coming talk, event. We're talking about radical things that people are looking to do to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be in this position. We should not be in this position, either as BC Epilepsy Society, a grieving mom, and grieving friends, and family, and all of the other families. So I want everybody to really take a look at our documentary series because we, we want to go nuclear with, this, with these stories. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a black spot on, on Canadian healthcare, and all of our American friends who are looking at this, who are promoting it, I've taken out um, uh, an ad in USA Today, hmm. um, I, am, I am blowing the lid off of this. Well, good for you. And thank you both so much for thank coming you. on the show today. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And please buy tickets and go see the documentary series. Uh, you can buy the tickets at bcepilepsy.com. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>